good evening, dear teachers, and good morning, Laura. So we are ready to start our webinar nine, five keys to reading comprehension in English. Do you hear me very well? Okay, so this is our ninth webinar, and I would like to remind you to take notes about keywords that the speaker will be using. You will need these words to complete the feedback form and to provide these keywords uh, to get a certificate for this course, workshop, sorry. And uh, of course, we will make sure that all the participants of today's webinar will leave with the knowledge of these words. But these are some measures that we need to identify who was attending the webinar. And I'm very happy to introduce our speaker today, Lara, Laura Ravich, sorry. And uh, Laura is a senior instructor and intensive English program coordinator in the American English Institute at the University of Oregon. And also she's the Dean of the Russian program at Concordia Language Villages. So this is our first speaker who speaks some, not some, very good Russian actually. But as this webinar is for English teachers, of course, this webinar will be in English. So Laura has been teaching English and Russian for over 20 years in the variety of contexts, including higher education institutions, as well as contexts that serve teens and young learners, both in the US and abroad. And uh, her English language teacher training work encompasses courses and workshops for teachers from over 30 countries. Her specialties include instructions and assessment of reading and writing, supporting diverse learners, experiential language learning and language program administration. Thank you very much, Laura, for agreeing to present for us today. And uh, you're welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, Yelena, for inviting me to take part in this webinar. And today we're going to be talking about the five things that we need to teach our learners, the five keys to get them to build competence in those three areas. Um, so as uh, Yelena mentioned, I have been teaching um, ESL reading and writing for many years. Um, and as someone who loves reading myself, one of the things that interested me about teaching reading in English to students was how to make it enjoyable for them. Um, maybe you have had the experience that you um, can teach students to read and decode the language that they're dealing with, uh, but they still read very slowly and it's not enjoyable for them. My goal as a teacher is to make their reading um, as fast and fun and exciting as reading in your first language. Um, of course, I could teach 100 workshops on this. You could take a whole course on this. So we will just be touching on a few of the main points today. Um, and then if you find some of them interesting, you can explore uh, more details on your own. So I'm just going to share my PowerPoint with you. Let's see. Okay. Let's see. Let's see. So do you see uh, the presenter view or the audience view. So I see the, uh, the presenters, okay. but you can click on this button on the right. But this is also okay. So uh, do you hear, oh, sorry, do you see Laura's presentation? Please unmute yourself or write in the chat. And also you can ask some questions if you have any. Okay. 
I'll just do it like this. Yeah. Okay. Great. Oh, it looks like we do have some yeah. things in the chat window. Wonderful. Okay. So, so everyone, the participants make a short. Uh, they uh, they sorry. They write that they can see the presentation. Wonderful. Okay, then let's go ahead and get started with our five keys to reading comprehension in English. Um, so, the first of our five keys is phonemic awareness. So, being able to identify and manipulate the sounds in the language. Our second key is phonics. So, with phonics, we are connecting the sounds of the language with the written symbols, um, the alphabet in English. Our next step is reading fluency. Um, after we master decoding, which is what's taught through phonemic awareness and phonics, our students can then move on to reading fluency, reading with speed, accuracy, and prosody. And we'll talk more about each of these elements throughout the presentation. The next point that I'll be talking about is vocabulary. Uh, after you become fluent, you need to understand, comprehend what you are reading, um, which means you need a large vocabulary. And then finally, um, you need to do more than just understand the words that you read, right? Our learners need to be able to understand the text as a whole. And that's what is meant by text comprehension. So these are the five keys that we will be discussing today. We'll be talking about why each one is important and what we can do as teachers to help our um, learners to better understand. So let's start with phonemic awareness. Um, phonemic awareness is the understanding of what those sounds are that make up the words that you hear. So for example, we may learn that this is a cat, right? Um, but in order to have phonemic awareness, we need to be able to break that word down and understand that we are hearing three separate sounds, k, a, t, right, cat. With phonemic awareness, we're talking just about the sounds, not about the writing. So you can work on phonemic awareness with students who don't know any letters yet. It's just about what they can hear. When you hear the word cat, what sounds do you hear? K, a, t. Phonemic awareness is part of a larger concept called phonological awareness, which includes onset and rhyme. So the fact that k, at, cat rhymes with bat, b, at, because they both have the same ending sound or rhyme, um, as well as syllable recognition, recognizing that cat, cat is one syllable, and kitten, for example, kitten is two syllables. Phonological awareness is important as a whole, but phonemic awareness is the part of phonological awareness that is absolutely essential for our learners to become strong readers. Let's talk about why phonemic awareness is so important, especially in English. Um, so research has shown that phonemic awareness can be a better predictor of literacy performance than many other components that people have traditionally associated with reading. So vocabulary knowledge, for example, is important, but it turns out that phonemic awareness is even more important. Um, and maybe the most exciting thing for us as teachers is that it is actually one of the easier things to teach. Um, there's a lot of impact that we can make just by teaching phonemic awareness to our learners. Um, and of course, one of the things about English, as we know, is that the letters are challenging. The spelling is unusual, right? But the sounds, the phonemes, can be easier for students to learn. So they can have that feeling of mastery when they learn to understand the sounds that they are hearing. They can help to carry them through the challenges of learning the orthography. So 
how can we teach it? Um, these are examples of teaching phonemic awareness to children. And I will talk in a minute about what we need to do to teach phonemic awareness to adults. But I wanted to play some examples for you of how teachers can present phonemic awareness to students. Boys and girls, we read just the other day one of our favorite books called The Hungry Thing. And in The Hungry Thing, there was a monster, and he only ate really silly things. He only ate rhyming words. Well, today, he's very hungry, but he only wants to eat words that rhyme with clay. Madison, can he eat cookies? No. Can he eat mice? No. Why not, Madison? Because he only wants to eat rhyming, rhyming words. He only wants to eat rhyming words. Can you think of a word? That rhymes with clay that you'd be able to eat? Noah, hey, hey, can you come on up and give our hungry thing some food right into his mouth? So there's an example of um, one way that a teacher is uh, presenting the idea of phonemic awareness, getting learners to listen for the, um, the sound A, right? Um, and you'll notice that nowhere in there do we see the written words, right? She's just having them attend orally. Here's another example. Hey, Brandon. Listen as I say three words. Box, fun, fam. All of these words have one sound that is the same. Just the sound is in all three words. I can hear both. Box. Fun, bam. Tell me the sound that you hear that is the same in these words. Ball, bike, bad. Oh, very good. Emily. So just another example of having students attend orally before they see something in writing. And here is a last example um, of something a little bit different. Um, so in this, in the first video, we were attending to the um, ending sounds of the word. In the second video, they were attending to the beginning sounds of the word. And we'll see something a little different in this third video. Okay, we're going to play phonemes now. Now, you remember phonemes are the sort of sounds you can hear in a word, like here's phonemes. So when I give you a word, I want you to count the phonemes on your fingers, like this, and then put them on your shoulder to show me that you're ready. And then when everyone's done it, I'll get you to show me and we'll count off the phonemes and see if you're right. So count your fingers, how many phonemes are in the word run. Right. Quietly count them, put them on your shoulder once you're ready, look at me, and show me. They sound it out, go. Nice and loud. How many phonemes are that? Okay, so in video number three, um, she was asking them to focus on the number of phonemes in the word, right? So all three of these approaches, attending to the sound at the beginning, attending to the sound at the end, and attending to the number of sounds in a word, are ways that we can raise phonemic awareness in our students. Um, many times, teachers will ask me, well, I understand how you would do this with children, but do we need to do the same thing with adults? With adults who already have phonemic awareness in their first language, you don't need to spend as much time on this instruction as you do with children. But when you think about activities that many of us do, such as minimal pairs, right? Do you hear ship or sheep, right? That is a kind of phonemic awareness. So it may be something that you are already doing, but you may not be thinking about how it relates to reading. So with adults, it may just be a matter of reframing or thinking about the sequence in which you teach phonemic awareness activities like minimal pairs. Have any of you heard of phonics? Type in the chat box, let me know. Have you heard of phonics? Hmm, I'm not seeing anyone 
typing in the chat box that they have heard of phonics. So I think, oh, let's see. Now we have some appearing. Yeah, we have Tatiana. Okay, so Tatiana has heard of phonics before. Um, but it looks like she's the only one. So um, we'll talk a little bit about um, Tatiana, have you taught phonics before? Okay, so Tatiana says no because she teaches at the tertiary level. Um, just like phonemic awareness, I would say phonics is something that you can teach at the primary, secondary, or tertiary level. Um, however, it is most useful with novice learners. So if you are teaching novice learners at the tertiary level, it may be appropriate. Um, but if you are teaching intermediate or advanced learners at the tertiary level, it's probably not. Um, so, and of course, how we teach phonics to children and how we teach phonics to adults, just like phonemic awareness. Um, those are two different approaches. So uh, let's talk for a minute about what phonics is. Phonics is where we focus on the letter sound correspondence. Um, and of course, you all know that in English, this is particularly difficult, right? Um, our vowels make lots of different sounds. Um, our vowel sounds are made by lots of different letter combinations. There are many rules to learn, and then there are many exceptions in addition to those words, those rules that we need to learn. And research shows that um, you really need to explicitly teach students these letter sound correspondences in order for them to learn. Um, Sometimes in the history of language teaching, um, there has been a theory that students will learn these correspondences by themselves if they are exposed to enough material. But research has shown that that does not usually happen and that explicit instruction can make these things happen much more quickly. So in the picture here, you can see some examples of phonics instruction and how we can show our learners that the sound A is made by combinations such as AI, AY, and A consonant E. And the sound E is made by vowel digraphs such as EE and EA. And then in the third picture, we see some of the many ways where we can make the sound I. So, Why is it important to teach phonics? I've talked about that a little bit. Um, and the fact that English has one of the most complex orthophonemic systems, lots of rules and exceptions. Um, and one of the most important reasons is because if students don't learn phonics, they struggle more to decode. And if students don't make it past the decoding stage, they don't become fluent and then they don't have the cognitive resources for comprehension. If they're thinking all the time about what sounds do these letters make, then it, they don't have anything left to think about what this means, what are the nuances of the reading, right? And um, as I said before, research really shows that receiving explicit phonics instruction helps students to develop their foundational reading skills. Um, so, phonics, how can we teach it? Um, there are many different approaches that we can take to teaching phonics. Um, there are some things that all good phonics approaches have in common, and then there are some places where we have room to be creative. So, one thing that is important is that teaching phonics is most effective after students have some degree of basic oral proficiency. In order to make the sound letter correspondence, they need to have some sounds to associate the letters with, right? Um, it is also helpful if they already have some literacy skills in their L1. 
especially if their L1 is an alphabetic language, um, like Kazakh or Russian, right? So if students can already associate the sounds of the Kazakh language or the Russian language with um, the graphemes, right, with the alphabet, then this is a skill that they can transfer to another language. Um, it's not impossible to teach L2 literacy as students are beginning to acquire L1 literacy, but it's usually easier and faster if they have already acquired L1 literacy. It's important to do it in a meaningful context. So as much as possible, we want to teach phonics using words that students already know, that they're already familiar with. So for example, if we're working with children, we might want to use the word cat instead of the word cab, right? Um, children do not often catch a taxi cab or they certainly don't talk about it. They may have learned the word cat though. And so they can make associations with that in their heads. Um, and then one area where we definitely have to be systematic is using explicit and direct instruction. Just occasionally talking about phonics is not enough. We need to have a sequenced, step-by-step -step approach to ensure that the phonetic um, and, the, and the graphics of the language are connected in our students' minds. And I'll be talking a little bit about how to do that. Um, so the sequence that we teach is important. Um, we can make some choices within a sequence. There's not one way that you need to teach every sound that we make um, or every graphic representation, but there are some rules about how we should think about sequencing what we teach. And then finally, through a synthetic approach. There are three different approaches to phonics. And for second language learners, there is one that is more appropriate called the synthetic approach. And I'll be talking about that in more detail in just a minute. Of course, of course, there are some words that do not follow the rules at all, right? And those words we teach as sight words. So it's important not to forget to teach those words as well. Um, and then there are other words <clears throat> that may well follow the patterns of English, that, but they're multisyllabic, right? So we start phonics when we're teaching with, with words of one syllable, and then we continue with multisyllabic words. So it's important to start with words that are shorter. <clears throat> so that's a brief overview of how we can teach phonics. Let's look at some of these points in more detail. So let's talk about explicit or direct instruction. What do you think I mean when I say explicit or direct instruction? What does that mean to you? You can type in the chat box. Does anyone have a guess? Here we go. Okay, so very clear teaching the rules. A teacher says to the learners what to do, like read the text. Yeah, so you all have um, <clears throat> generally the right idea. Um, it, it is certainly clear, um, and the, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a bit of a cold. The important thing to remember is that with explicit or direct instruction, you are giving the learners exactly what they need. Um, so we're not asking the learners questions. We're not um, giving many possibilities, right? We are giving them one specific piece of information or task to perform that has a right or wrong way, right? And then giving them clear feedback. Um, so the procedure might be something like this. Um, 
the we have a concept like we want to teach the students that this is the letter B and it makes the sound B, right? So with explicit instruction, the teacher would say something like, my turn, what letter? And show a picture, right? What letter? B, what sound? B. And the students would understand then that the next step, right? We teach our students these routines in class, that the next step is our turn and we work together and we say our turn. What letter? B. What sound? B. And then we move to the students. Your turn. Sasha, what letter? And Sasha says B. Sasha, what sound? B, right? So <clears throat> um, we learn a lot about how we should be more student-centered, right? Um, this seems very teacher-centered, and it is. So it's important that we not spend all of our lessons <clears throat> doing activities like this that are very teacher-centered. But for phonics instruction in particular, some of our instruction has to be done this way because so many sounds in English are not possible to learn without direct information from the teacher. So the structure for direct instruction from the teacher involves first modeling with the teacher, then guiding the students and doing it together, and then providing independent practice. And you can see that here with my turn as a model, our turn as a guide, where we work to talk together with the students, and your turn as independent practice. And in explicit or direct instruction, feedback is also a very important component. So if Sasha tells me that that's the letter D, or it makes the sound D, I would immediately respond, actually, that's not D, and it doesn't make the sound D. That's B, and it makes the sound B, and then ask him to repeat, right? What letter? B. B. What sound? B. Um, so it's important for students to get immediate feedback about phonics. So we also talked about how phonics needs to be sequenced, right? Um, and there's two types of sequencing that we talk about in phonics. Um, one is going from simple to complex, and the other is going from common to uncommon. So um, when we think about simple to complex, um, take a moment to think about examples from these categories. You don't need to type them, but just think about that. What do you think it means? Simple versus complex. So here's my answer to that. Um, an example of something simple in phonics is individual consonants, right? Like B and B. Um, that's a letter that really only makes one sound, right? B, nice and easy. Um, something complex though, would be vowel digraphs, right? Those vowel sounds that are made with two vowels, like the sound E or the sound I. They can be made in different ways with different combinations of letters. It's complicated, right? Um, so when we, we talk about sequencing, that means that we want to start with individual consonants. So the first five or so letters that we wanna to teach to students are going to be individual consonants that consistently make a predictable sound, right? And after we finish teaching those, then we move in, on to more complicated things like vowel digraphs or consonant blends. Um, <clears throat> and I could talk for a long time about the details about how you teach all of those things, um, but that would be for a separate webinar just on phonics. Um, and I know this is probably not the step that is the most interesting for all of you, so I will not dwell on step-by-step -step phonics instruction for much longer. Um, but if you're interested in that topic uh, and let Ileana know, it's certainly something I could talk about sometime in the future. Um, the next sequence that we want to think about is from common to uncommon. So you can think about what letters or sounds are most common in English, and those are the ones we would need to teach first. Um, and then work our way to the sounds and letters that are less common in English. So you can think to yourself what you think those might be. And then I'll give you some examples. 
So the letters S and E are very common in English. Um, and the letters X and Q, for example, are not very common in English. So those might be words that we teach much later, right? So <clears throat> when we're teaching phonics, we also need to think about what approach we're going to use. Um, synthetic phonics is the approach where we start with the, the letters and sounds and then put them into words, right? Here's the sound B. What kind of words do we hear the sound B in, right? How can we make a word using the sound B? And that's the approach that um, research has shown to be the most effective with English language learners. Um, the other two types of phonics approaches are analytic and analogy. Um, analytic is where we take a word like here's pig and pot and pipe. What sound is at the beginning of all of those words? P, right? Um, and that can be effective with um, uh, first language learners or with learners who are already very fluent and have a large vocabulary in English, but are just beginning to learn to read. Uh, but we tend to see that kind of learner less frequently in English language teaching contexts like the ones that you all are working in. Um, so rather than analytic phonics, you probably want to focus on synthetic phonics. But you might find analogy phonics to be useful. Um, analogy phonics is when we use um, something that we have encountered in one phonetic context in another one. So for example, after we learn the EA sound is in meat, if we encounter it again in um, <clears throat> a word like near, um, the EA sound, right, the E sound, and the fact that EA makes the E sound is something that we can generalize to a different context. Um, so that can be useful, um, certainly useful for English language learners, um, but it is useful in fewer contexts, of course, than synthetic phonics, which can be used with any sound, um, including new ones that you're introducing for the first time, whereas analogy is only appropriate for ones that you have introduced before. So synthetic goes from letter to word, analytic goes from word to sound, an analogy is used for words that have similar sounds in them. <clears throat> so now we're going to move on after our students have mastered decoding with the steps of phonemic awareness and phonics, then we can move on to working on reading fluency. And this is my favorite of the five keys to reading comprehension, um, because I think it's really key to enjoying reading. Um, and it's one that we often leave out and I think it's one of the reasons that it's so hard for us to learn to really enjoy to read in our second language. Um, <clears throat> so fluency. Um, we all have an understanding of fluency, right? We may say that we speak English fluently or we don't, right? Um, we may have different ideas of what fluency means in terms of knowing a foreign language. But for reading, fluency has a very specific definition. Um, it includes the components of accuracy. When you read words, are you reading the actual word that is on the page, right? Can you decode it? Um, and can you do it automatically or at a fast rate, right? If you still need to sound out and decode each letter, then that is not um, fluency, right? That's still working at the decoding stage. You need to be able to quickly recognize words. Um, sometimes we talk about this as converting um, the oral learning of the decoding stage and the sounds of the words to visual recognition. So st students need to go from having to think about what each sound of the word is to automatically recognizing the word visually. And then the third element of fluency is prosody, being able to read with expression, right? Um, so we'll talk a little bit about how we can develop these things in our readers. Um, but first, let's talk about why it's important. Uh, one of the main reasons it's, it's important is that slow reading impacts working memory. If you are sounding out every single letter um, or even syllable by syllable, by the time you get to the second or third word, you've forgotten what the first word meant, right? By the time you get to the end of the sentence, you don't remember anything. So if you read slowly, you have trouble 
remembering the meaning of things that you read. Um, prosody can assist in comprehension. When you read with expression, you understand the author's meaning better. Um, you understand the different positions that characters might take in the story and the relationship between ideas. So one important thing to know is that the goal for native English speakers is to read 230 words per minute by eighth grade. Um, so you can see how quickly your learners are reading. Um, and once students can read at the eighth grade level, they can handle most texts. Um, so if your students aren't reading 230 words per minute um, accurately, then that means that they may have a challenge comprehending texts that are written for adults, right? Many texts that are written for adults are actually not written much higher than an eighth grade level. So if they can read at an eighth grade level, they can handle many things um, except for you know, very academic texts. Um, but that should be sort of your, your minimum goal that you have for your students, um, this 230 words per minute. So, uh, the example I like to give is um, this sentence, which you may recognize from the beginning of Harry Potter. Um, if we look at the sentence, look at all of the parts of that first sentence, right? We have Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four, Privet Drive. We're proud to say the subject of were is Mr. and Mrs. Dursley. They're way at the beginning of the sentence, before of number four, Privet Drive. They were proud to say that. So here we have an embedded clause here. They were perfectly very normal. Thank you very much. My goodness, there's a lot going on in that sentence. If I have to sound it out word by word, mer, uh, Mr. and mer, Mrs. Dursley, Right, if I'm reading that slowly, there is no way that by the time I get to we're proud to say that I'm going to have any idea who is proud, right? So this is an example of, you know, very popular children's literature, um, but it still requires a really strong degree of fluency in order to be able to enjoy reading it, right? Um, so let's look at how we can teach it, right? Many times people think, oh, fluency is just something you have to get to on your own. The students just have to read a lot, learn a lot of words, and they will become fluent, right? Um, they just have to work hard. And if they don't become fluent, it's their fault, they're not working hard enough, right? But as teachers, there's actually a lot of strategies that we can use to help students develop fluency. Finding the time to fit it into your class is another question and a real, challenge depending on your context, but there are things that we can do. So let's look at what they are. Um, <clears throat> one thing that we can do is extensive reading. Um, so extensive reading is something that needs to be done at the independent level. So you need to look at what your students can read and understand um, accurately about 98%, right? So this means probably much lower than what you're teaching them in class. It should be something easy for them, right? Um, and there are many, many graded readers available in English where you can order different levels of difficulty of interesting, enjoyable, engaging books to read. And you can have the students read a page and you can see, are they understanding and accurately reading 98% of that first page? If they are, then that would be a good book for them to use for extensive reading. Um, so, um, yeah, so extensive reading, um, uh, I see Tatiana has mentioned that it's reading for pleasure mainly. Yes, definitely. So with extensive reading, we want it to be um, fun for students. Um, this, is, this is where they, they do the practice, right? We can't say that students need to practice reading more if we're not providing them with fun and easy things for them to read, right? So we need to find ways to get them extensive reading. And you can even find free passages online um, that are graded or leveled that they can read. Um, so that's one approach that we can use. Another approach is repeated reading. Um, it turns out that if students read the same passage over and over again, it really helps them to develop fluency. Um, however, it can also be boring, right? 
So we need to think of ways where we can make repeated reading, reading the same text again and again, interesting, right? Um, so one example is um, to memorize things and perform them, right? Um, so um, if you have students doing things like memorizing and performing poetry, that can help. Now, once it's memorized, it's no longer reading, right? So the process of memorizing it can involve repeated reading. Um, but then once it's memorized, it's not useful as a reading activity anymore. Um, so one uh, strategy that is recommended by research in reading fluency is reader's theater, where students don't memorize the words, but they keep the script with them and they read. And they have to read with expression just as if they had it memorized, but they still have the words in front of them and they're expected to refer to them. And they rehearse these scenes many times with their script and perform it with the script. Um, and because they are performing it, just like with poetry memorization, they have that need to do it well, right? That genuine intrinsic motivation to read it again and again and again until it sounds right. Another way to um, provide motivation for repeated read reading is through timing, right? Um, many students have a competitive drive and they want to increase their reading speed, right? So if you have students time themselves as they read and make a graph of how their reading speed increases, you can tell them, for example, they need to repeat their reading until they reach a certain speed, right? And this provides them motivation to read quickly. Um, other things that you can use are read alouds, where the teacher reads aloud or the students read aloud, choral reading, where teachers and students read together, um, or partner reading, where, teach, where students work in pairs and they read to each other, and the one who's not reading sort of keeps an eye on the page to make sure that it's accurate, right? And they can take turns reading the same passage. Um, and that also makes it a little bit interesting because m listening to my friend read is a different activity than me reading, but it also increases my fluency because I'm hearing the way that it sounds. So those are, um, are some examples of ways that we can teach reading fluency. That's another topic I could talk about on its own for several hours. Um, but in order to make it through all five components, we will leave it there. Um, our next topic is component four, vocabulary. So we've moved through decoding, we've moved through fluency, and now here we are um, on the border between fluency and comprehension. And vocabulary is actually important for both. It has a reciprocal relationship with um, fluency and comprehension. Because when you understand a vocabulary word, you actually recognize it more quickly visually. So the more you vocabulary you know, the faster you read. The faster you read, the more vocabulary you encounter and the more words you learn. So it goes back and forth between, between fluency and comprehension. So I think you are all familiar with the concept of vocabulary. I won't spend much time explaining what it is, but I do want to remind you that it's not just knowing the definition of a word. You need to know the denotation right, exactly what it means. The connotation, does it give me a negative feeling, a positive feeling? Would I like it if someone used that word about me, right? Um, you need to know the collocations. Are there certain other words that it usually comes with? If I can anticipate that when I see this word, I will usually see another word right after it, I'll read faster, right? Um, synonyms and antonyms, right? So if we really want to know a vocabulary word, we need to know all of those things. Um, why is it important? Well, it's important to have a large vocabulary um, for many reasons. The first 100 most common words actually make up 50% of what we read. So those first 100 words are the most important, right? Um, the first 1,000 are also very important. That gets up, us up to 75% of academic texts or 85% of conversation. Um, and if we get up to the top 2,000 words, 
Then we cover 90% of words in most written texts, right? So we can begin to guess the words that are missing. So it's really important if we want our students to be able to read things easily, they need to get up to that top 2000. And remember, we said that in order to read fluently, you need to be able to accurately read about 98%. So the top 2000 only gets us up to 90%. Um, and adding another 1000 only gets us up to 92%, right? So we actually need to know a lot of words in order to read authentic texts easily, right? Now we can find many pedagogical student texts for our students to read that have only the first 1000 word families. There are many texts that are written for our students at that level, but the world will open up to them if they add another thousand and another thousand. Um, and this is all based on the work of Paul Nation, who's one of the premier vocabulary researchers in English language teaching. So how do we teach it? Um, Scott Thornbury has identified sequences of vocabulary teaching tasks from identifying to producing. Um, so from easier to harder tasks. So first identifying might be something where um, students uh, are just looking and circling a certain word, right? Um, or an activity where they have a word search with scrambled letters and they have to find the target word. So it's just recognizing the visual form. Um, we might have selecting, right? Um, picking words that fit a certain category, for example, like find all of the words for fruit on this page, circle apple, circle banana, right? Uh, matching, and matching I think is the most popular activity that we usually see in vocabulary work that teachers create, right? Match the word with its definition, match the word with its synonym. Um, but um, many times we see people stop with matching. Um, and Thornberry would say, we can't stop with matching. We need to really recycle, integrate, and deepen our knowledge of vocabulary words. And to do that, we need to make things more complex. We need to move up to the top of Bloom's taxonomy. So some of you may be familiar with Bloom's taxonomy, um, which is how we think about critical thinking, right? Remembering something is pretty easy, understanding it is harder, applying it to a situation um, makes us think even more about it. Using that information to analyze something um, is really hard. And then evaluating it, deciding if it's good or bad and why, that's quite a bit more difficult than just remembering or understanding and then creating making something new that's something that really requires a lot of um, critical thinking right so when we look at this um, vocabulary sequence in many ways it moves along the same levels of bloom's taxonomy so if we stop with matching that's really near the bottom that's not thinking very hard about the word um, and it's not deepening our knowledge enough so we need to take students up to activities like sorting, um, where we ask them to um, develop categories and sort words into them. For example, animals that I would like to have live in my house and animals that I would not like to have live in my house, right? And then we can have an argument maybe with our partners about um, whether a snake is a good animal to have live in our house or not, right? People can have different opinions about that. Um, and ranking, right? So maybe we take those animals and we decide which one we would most like. Well, I would most like a dog. Well, I would like most like a snake. Why? What are the benefits, right? They're really engaging critically with these different vocabulary words, thinking about them justifying their opinions, right? And then finally, producing, right? Creating um, new material using these words. Um, so these are the activities where you ask students to use 10 of your new vocabulary words in a paragraph, for example. Um, of course, you can have it more structured. Production can also be structured. So um, even a gap fill activity can, can count as production. Um, but um, the more original the production is, the more it deepens the vocabulary knowledge. So um, I also want to mention that um, once we get beyond those first 3,000 words, 
uh, we really need to look at what words will be useful for our students. Um, so if they're going into an academic area, for example, um, instead of going to the 4,000 most common words, we might want to go straight to the academic word list, which is a list of um, about 570 most common academic word families. Um, and then the other thing you want to teach them after they've mastered those first 3,000 words is specific strategies for top-down and bottom-up vocabulary. So top-down is when you use the context to figure out something small, right? Bottom-up is when you use the small things to figure out the larger concept. So guessing from context is a top-down vocabulary strategy that students can use where they look at the meaning of the whole sentence and try and figure out the meaning of one component vocabulary word. Um, how to use a dictionary well, um, and how to use technological tools like corpora. Um, if you don't know what a language corpus is, that is another topic that I could talk about for several hours. Um, it, they are uh, fantastic um, databases of language that you can use to search for many different examples of how language is used. And we have quite a lot of them in English. Um, it's nice to, to teach a language that is commonly taught um, because you have many technological tools that you can use. There are many fewer corpora of Russian that I can find than there are English um, because it's not as prevalently taught as a second language. So you're lucky to be teaching English. Um, there are many, many resources for corpora that you can use to search. Some that are very specific. If you're teaching students who are going into certain specific fields, there are corpora that you can narrow to just agriculture, for example. Um, and then finally, the last strategy that we need to teach is analyzing word parts and forms, prefixes and suffixes and roots. Um, so those strategies are things that we can use so that students can, on their own, um, work with new words after those first 3,000. So finally, we, after we have mastered our decoding and we have um, improved our fluency, as we learn the vocabulary, our comprehension is improving, but um, comprehension is not just comprehension of individual words, right? We need to move to the discourse level as well. So what is comprehension? On a basic level, it is understanding what you read. Um, Many people focus on finding the main idea and supporting details, right? Um, but there are other skills involved, like inferencing, right? Making an educated guess about what the writer meant based on the information they have provided and your understanding of the world and your background knowledge. Um, so using your background knowledge to make inferences and to make judgments about the text. Distinguishing between fact and opinion, right? We need to be able to read critically. Is this thing in front of us something that we should believe that's fact, or is it just someone's opinion? Those are all important in order to truly comprehend a text. So you can see how that goes beyond vocabulary, right? I could know all the words, but I might still have trouble understanding what the most important part of the passage is, right? That's a different skill. So why does it matter? Well, we can see from this comic here um, where Calvin has a book to read for his class um, and he has a whole book. He's very frustrated, a lot of homework, right? Um, so he reads it very quickly, flipping through the pages, right? And he's very happy and proud of himself. But his tiger friend, Hobbes, um, points out that probably Calvin has not actually understood anything he read, right? And this is an extreme example, but students can become fluent without actually developing comprehension. They can learn those letter sound um, correspondences and be able to read quite quickly, but not process the language and the ideas in the text and actually understand what they're reading. So it's not enough for students to read quickly and sound good, Right? We have to know they actually understand. So let's see how we can teach that. Um, comprehension um, at the discourse level focuses primarily on top-down strategies. 
So things like predicting content based on title or headings or context or graphics. So telling students to use different strategies, and there are many strategies out there um, that give students steps that they can walk through, where step number one is look at the headings um, and the pictures, and step number two is guess what you think you will see, and step number three is read and check to see if you're right. There are many different strategies that go step by step like that, and you can Google reading comprehension strategies for predicting, and, you can, and they'll give you many, many different possibilities. Um, another strategy we might want to teach is skimming, right? Um, if we want students to be able to read quickly but still understand something, right, be able to read efficiently, they should be able to skim for general content and figure out what something is about, right? And maybe also then skim for the structure of the text and figure out where they need to look if they're looking for some specific information. Um, and understand, are they seeing something that's compared and contrasted? Are they seeing a process, right? Um, understanding the structure of the text. Then finally, they need to learn to apply their world knowledge to make inferences. Um, so they make connections between the text and other texts they've read, um, connections between the text and their personal experience, and connections between the text and other contexts that they've seen in the world. Um, and that helps them to understand what the author is trying to say, but may not have expressed literally. And then finally, um, teaching students to annotate and take notes in the margins. Um, this is both an effective orienting task. It makes students pay attention more. If you have to write down, then it's hard to just you know, do that thing that sometimes students do, where we read a paragraph and we get to the end and we realize we were not paying attention, right? And you missed the whole thing. If you're taking notes, you pay more attention, right? So it's an orienting task that helps you to do that. But it also helps you to practice the skill of finding the most important information because you have to write it there in the margins. So I've talked to you today about phonemic awareness, phonics, reading fluency, vocabulary, and text comprehension. These are our five keys to reading comprehension. Um, and we need to devote time to each of them in class um, to varying degrees in order to make sure that our students become efficient and effective readers. And I would be happy to take questions for our remaining couple of minutes. Okay. So actually I have five questions, but I will wait for other participants. Okay. So please uh, write your questions in the chat or unmute yourself. And also, if you don't have uh, some question now, you don't forget that you have a chance to ask questions in the feedback form. So uh, let's wait for some questions and then, oh, yeah. there is a question. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How can I help learners to remember the vocabulary they've learned? Okay, that's a great question. Um, and basically it has to do with the number of times that they encounter a word um, and how intentionally they encounter the word. So um, if we go back to the graphic that I showed you, um, for vocabulary, um, if you do all of these different kinds of activities, um, that will help them to remember it, right? They'll be encountering it in many different contexts. Um, the other thing that you can do, the reason that these activities work well is because they really help learners to associate the vocabulary with meaningful contexts. Um, research on vocabulary acquisition shows that the more meaningful and contextualized you can make the vocabulary learning process, the more likely they are to remember it. So if you introduce vocabulary in a context, um, for example, if you s teach students, I'm cold, I'm hot, I'm warm, they won't remember it as well. But if you teach them, I'm cold, um, so I need a jacket, right? I'm cold, I need a jacket that will help them to remember it, 
right? If you teach them, I'm hot, I need a fan, right? That will help them to, to learn it. If you want to teach them, I'm hold, cold, I'm hot, I'm warm, I'm cold, so I put on a jacket. Now I'm hot, I will take off my jacket. Now I'm warm, this is good, right? A sequence like that can help them to remember the vocabulary as well, um, rather than just a list of a bunch of words in the same semantic context. Um, the other thing, of course, that's really important is that it has to be cumulative. You can't have them learn a list of words and then never use those words again. So um, whatever words they use in unit one, you need to make sure that you're providing opportunity for them to use them again in unit two. And if you do vocabulary tests, um, they should always be cumulative. So if you're testing the vocabulary in unit four, there should be some extra questions on there that includes random samples of vocabulary from unit one and unit two, so the students know they have to keep studying them. Um, okay, so comprehension strategies that can be used at the low intermediate level for better results. Um, I think any of the comprehension strategies that I've mentioned can be used at the low intermediate level. Um, the question is more what level of text you use. So um, we'll go back to the comprehension strategies. Um, so um, you can do finding main idea and details, inferencing, relating background knowledge. You can do all of those things at low intermediate level. Um, they will all help students. Um, you know, the easiest one, of course, is finding the main idea and supporting details, but it's also the less interesting one. Um, so to keep students engaged, right, you want to use some of the other tasks and also to move them to a higher level. So the key is to use a text that is accessible to them um, at the low intermediate level, and then you can use any of these strategies. Um, let me know if I didn't answer that question completely. Um, now we have a question from Anastasia. Um, how much time is necessary to spend for reading every lesson? Oh, that's one of those questions that I have to answer. It depends on your context. Um, how many hours of English do you have a day? What are your students' goals? What level are they at now? Um, how much homework time do they have outside of class? Um, how orally fluent are they? It, the answer will be really different depending on the answers to those questions. Um, do they have other classes that focus more on reading or is your class their only class? Um, there are many variables that could affect the answer to that question. Any other questions? So, um while uh, other participants are writing other questions. So, uh, Laura, I will not ask all my five questions and I have six, I will provide them in the feedback form. Uh, so I would like to ask you if you could share this PowerPoint with the participants. So I will encourage it to follow up email. And uh, can you provide us with some links for graded readings? Yes. And uh, you've mentioned also academic word list mm -hmm. and corpora. corpora. Yes, yeah. I was going to offer to provide links to those things. So yeah. yes, exactly. and that would be great. I think uh, then we can um, explore them in more detail and Definitely. see how we can use them in our classroom. Of course. And as for other questions, I will write them in the follow in the feedback form. There is one more question. Um, there are many excellent resources to use with beginner level students. I will give some links to Yelena. I think that's the easiest way. Um, is it compulsory to follow three steps as pre-reading, while reading, after reading? It's not compulsory. There are contexts where you don't need to do it. So for example, with extensive reading, um, you might not need to do pre-reading. Um, and after reading is desirable, but not necessary and needs to be enjoyable. Um, so it's not necessary in every reading task to do pre-reading, while reading, and after reading. But in most of your instructional whole class reading times, when, when you're working on comprehension in particular, um, if you're working, working on comprehension with a new text as a whole class, that's when you should generally do pre-reading, while reading, and after reading.
That's a great question. Okay. So if you have some more questions, please make sure you write them in the feedback form. And uh, also don't forget to use the three keywords and your comments for the speaker. I'm sure Laura will appreciate them. And if you have some questions, you can mention them too. So we will send you a link to the recording of this video and uh, the feedback form for you to complete. And please write down your questions too. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Laura, for speaking for us today and having this great presentation. Um, I'm sure that all the participants have some uh, new ideas how to improve teaching reading and what activities they can use. So I will be looking forward to your email with your PowerPoint and these three things that we mentioned. So absolutely. And uh, I hope that you, we can have one more special webinar on phonics or fluency. I will include this question in the feedback form. So okay. and we'll see how many participants are interested in this, in this uh -huh. topic. So, and I think we maybe, we can plan some webinar in autumn. That sounds wonderful. I would be happy to join you all again. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.